Bronwyn is the Pro Vice Chancellor for Indigenous Engagement and the BHP Bits, Billiton Mitsubishi Alliance, um, BMA, Chair in Indigenous Engagement at Siku University. Uh, Bronwyn is able to strategically advance Indigenous engagement roles, um, agendas through this role, and that includes in, in local, state, national and international contexts. Uh, Bronwyn is very rega well regarded here at CQU. She's our president of academic board. Uh, she's also the elected chairperson of the CQ and Southwest Regional Aboriginal and Islander Community Controlled Health Organisation. And she's also one of the leads for NIRICAN, which is the National Indigenous Knowledges um, Network. Um, I'm really pleased to invite her for her keynote, um, which is Beyond the Rhetoric, Engaging with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Peoples in Regional Contexts. Please welcome Brendan. Thanks, Thanks, Susan. Can people hear me? Yeah. Yep. Now, I haven't made an error on my cover up there, Beyond the Rhetoric. I just wanted to say it twice, because that's the message I'm giving this afternoon. But before I begin um, with my presentation this afternoon, I do want to um, commence by acknowledging the Durumbal people on whose land that I speak this afternoon um, in a formal way. I also want to acknowledge them in terms of I reside here. This is where I spend most of my time. I sleep here. I love here on this land. I cry. I laugh. I do lots of things on this country. I work, I engage with people, I dream on this country, and I also vision upon this country. And I think for me, some of that's part of what you'll hear this afternoon. Um, it is their elders and elders of the past of the Durumbal that I acknowledge as well this afternoon and elders of the present. I also acknowledge their elders of the future and the other elders of the future that I work with today and also all the tomorrows that are yet to happen. I also want to make mention of the artwork in the room, and I know that was mentioned as we commenced uh, early yesterday. And for me, I take some comfort in having um, the work of the Capricornia Arts Mob um, here in the room. I am a member of the Capricornia Arts Mob, so um, I do a lot of academic work, and I am the Pro Vice Chancellor of of Indigenous Engagement and BHP Chair in Indigenous Engagement, but I also am a uh, visual artist and also um, a performance poet. And that's what I do and contribute through the community in that way. Um, for me, it also comforts me to think that we can be in this room, in this theatre, and we can talk about things that Dave Swain up the back might be interested in, in terms of agricultural matters. We can talk about political matters. We can talk about science matters, academic matters. We can talk about art matters. Um, we've also had um, ceremony in this room. We've had ceremony when we installed earlier this year the new chancellor to this university. And we've also had Aboriginal ceremony in this room um, for sorry business that has happened in this university. So for me, in terms of this theatre, it's quite special in my heart and my spirit place, but also tells me that it's also about our truth in terms of living a regional life, being a regional-based person, being in a regional education setting, and be, being within a regional university. And I know those other people that are from regional universities probably have buildings and places that lots and lots of things happen on from community, from um, the university, and all of that intertwined together. And this represents that for me. The other part of that truth of being a regional person and living a, a regional life, and certainly being an Aboriginal person, not from this place, but from South East Queensland, uh, a Murray woman, is the truth that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people live, and that we're not just living, we're alive, and in some cases just surviving, and in other cases thriving, and is that that I talked to this afternoon, and the realities of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in regional areas. Um, and I flag with you at this point that I will be presenting quite a bit of data this afternoon, and I know for some people you might know snippets of that data, for other people, you may know none of that data. For some people, when I have conversations, I know that people don't know much about Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people other than what you may know from us or about us through media, through TV, through maybe being a netball player on a netball court with a young 
as a young person with another young person who happened to be Aboriginal, or because your child played football with an Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander person, or you're on a committee, or you work in a university with Aboriginal people. So I want to give you a bigger, bit of an idea of a bigger snapshot of how we're placed and what our situation is now, but also what is about to come. And I don't want to create fear in people, but for some of us in terms of uh, Indigenous leadership, um, there is very clearly patterns in our demographics that we need to be ready for and that we need to start thinking about in terms of how we're going to address some of the issues. And that's what I'm going to talk about this afternoon. I'm also wanting to start for you to challenge yourselves around some of the language that you may hear, that you may even use, it slips out sometimes, or that may be under your tongue, not on top of your tongue when you speak. And I'm not saying that in a blaming way, I'm saying that in a way that sometimes we're taught things and taught ways to think or ways to be or ways to act or ways to talk and we're not really critically reflective of those and they slip out sometimes. So I'm going to start with the data on where we are, where Aboriginal people live. I'm not sure if people are aware of some of these stats. So 31% of all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people actually live in New South Wales. 29% of all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people actually live in Queensland. If you add those together, it is 60%. More than half of the Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander population live in two states, Queensland and New South Wales. I can see some people frowning. This is the data. This is from the AB, ABS. This is also from other data sets that we can gain access to, the Nazi HEC um, data. There's a whole range of data that we can use, but this is from the ABS around where Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander people live. Okay? We're not all out there in the Northern Territory. We're not all up there in Thursday Island. In fact, 60% is living in New South Wales and Queensland. Okay. In terms of um, the 2015 projected data, this material comes from ANU and the work that they do around economic development um, and scheduling of projections based on births and deaths and chronic disease and the ABS data for specific Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander populations and the national population data. 35% of all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people actually live in capital cities. People know that? Okay, some people do. A lot of people don't. When I'm talking about capital cities, I'm talking about Brisbane, and there will be some Sydney, Melbourne, Adelaide, Perth, Darwin. Um, the Brisbane capital city does not refer to Toowoomba, Ipswich, Sunshine Coast or Gold Coast in that data collection. That's included in the next rung off there, which is the regional in or out data. And then 20% live in remote or very remote communities. So the reality is that the data states to us and tells us that the greater number of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people actually live in capital cities or regional centres close to the other centres um, or big regional centres outward, like Rockhampton, could be Mount Isa. And there are key centres around the country where the numbers of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in regional centres is growing. And anyone lives in Toowoomba, you can show hands, anyone here from Toowoomba, you will actually physically see there's an increase in Toowoomba, people walking around, also in that Ipswich belt from Ipswich to Toowoomba. And there's other communities like that where the numbers are increasing. This is what some people get quite surprised at. The three biggest Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities in the country, Brisbane, New South Wales Central and North Coast, and the Sydney to Wollongong Belt. And in fact, the biggest community is that Sydney, uh, New South Wales Central North Coast area, which people who would know that area would includes Western Sydney. Biggest Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community in the country closely followed by Brisbane. Um, Brisbane in 2000, early 2015, end of 2014, estimated that it hit 60,000 Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. The projections from ANU is that by 2020 will be up around the 80,000 mark. Okay? We're talking large numbers of people. And people are on the move, as well as having more children, and I'll show you some of that data soon. 
29 per cent of all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people live in those three, three areas or three regions. In terms of the population, um, we're a very young population. 36 per cent of all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are under 15. I was just telling our um, DVC vet here, who's going to be our provost next year, that in many communities, um, over 50 per cent of the population are actually under 20. There is now current data coming through that that could be, for some communities, could be 18 or 19, where 50 per cent is under 18 or 19. You think about what that might mean in a community. Think about what that means in terms of who's looking after the children, who's running kids around, who's being on committees, who's on the local Aboriginal Health Service Committee, who's rocking up to the PNC committee, maybe no one, because people are engaged and busy. There may be no people there to do that. They're off doing other things, caring for people, maybe working. Okay? You think about what that means in a real sense. And then we at the university sometimes go, oh, yeah, we'll go and get some people for our committee program committee. You know, we'll get them, you know, we, and it somehow ends up in my office, I'm thinking, yeah, we're looking at 10 or 20 committees that people want people for. Where are these people going to come from? That's what I think in my head. I can't say it like that, but that's what I think in my head. Where are these people going to come from? You know, when I look at who's around in those communities and who has the capacity and who is not engaged in things. I'm not saying it can't happen, but I'm just thinking about sometimes the mechanics and reality. Um, and as I've said there, that the data collection suggests that our population is getting younger. We've also got fewer older people when you compare it with the non-Indigenous population. And last week I was in Cairns and I had some really um, concentrated discussions with Associate Professor Henrietta Mari, and we've had some ongoing discussions over a period of time about this. Um, and there is material coming out of Canada and the USA on the same thing, that we have that small group of older people which are, we could be looking at 60s, 70s, 80s, and there are Aboriginal and Torres people of that age who are now starting to pass on. And they're passing on through things that are about old age, but in a comparative sense to non-Indigenous people. We then have another group that's 40 to 60-year-olds who have premature um, diseases, chronic diseases, heart disease, kidney <coughs> failure, um, onset diabetes, maybe from 35 or 40, those individuals are also starting to pass on at faster rates than they should be. Okay? So we have this mass young population coming ahead and our older people are passing on and that 40 to 60 year age group are quite unwell overall as a collective. I'm not talking about individuals, I'm talking about as a collective. So there's going to be a point in the future, and it is called, in the Canadian context, it's called a demographic tsunami, where those young people in 10 to 20 years' time will be growing up and being older, and we will have less older people and less elders, less people who are leaders, who are going to support them, mentor them, and run our organisations. Okay? That's what we're looking at in the future. In terms of the regions, that is what is also coming forward within our regions. That's what we've got to start working on and thinking about how we manage that, how we engage with people and what we do about this. I've got that um, graph up there and I know it's not too good but you can still see what I'm talking about here. That's the zero to four group here. That's the five to ten. That's that young group. Look over here at non-Indigenous group. This group here is ageing. It's going to increase out here. Our group, this group's going to come in like that and keep going. Sorry, and I can't, I'm trying to do it left handed. Not too good at left hand. This is going to come down here a bit, and then that's going to keep going right out like that. That's the projections. Okay, you all see that? That's what we're looking at. We look at education, now something's, there's some increases and good things happening, but there's a bit of catch up that needs to happen. So when our young people start at school, and this was really fantastic to see, that 92% of all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children are actually engaged in some form of education as a five year old. That's pretty good. I'm really happy with that. That's an improvement, it's an increase. 
is something to kind of cherish and to think, yeah, it's, it's happening. People are going to school as a five-year-old. The other ones may be ill, they may be living away, they may be some, something may be happening that they're not at school. However, 29% of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people reported year 10 as their highest um, com school completion, and 25% completed year 12, compared with 52% of no, um, non-Indigenous people completing year 12. 26% of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people reported having a post-school qualification, compared to 49% of non-Indigenous people with a post-school qualification. And 4.6% of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people had attained a bachelor's degree or higher, compared with 20% non-Indigenous people. So that projection's not very good, but I'm just hoping that some of the stats we're starting to see in terms of our, particularly in Queensland, I haven't really drilled down into some of the other states or the territory data for um, school completions and school participation. Queensland is starting to improve the data, um, which is a great turnaround. In terms of schooling, don't be mistaken uh, when you hear oh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people don't do maths or science and therefore we're not going to end up in sciences and, and uh, you know, mathematics or STEM areas. Um, particularly if you look at the last point there, 79% of all year five Indigenous students were at or above the national minimum standard in terms of numeracy. And when I look at all the other things like spelling and sciences, we're right up there. We're all over. It's over 75% to 95% for all of them. So something happens to our young people between around that year three, year five, and then onwards to like the year eight, year nine, year 10, just gets worse and worse. And the Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander people in the room would, would know that too. You'd know that in your own families. In terms of employment, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, 42% of all 15 years and over were actually employed. You rarely hear that, do you, in the media? You often hear we're unemployed, we're sitting around, hanging out, the young people aren't doing anything. And 42% could be better, could be a lot better, but they're still 42% employed. The issue is that they're employed in areas that they could have other choices within. So they're employed in areas that uh, tend to be labourer or community and service workers, and a lot of Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander young people are employed in Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander businesses and industry and corporations. If we look at the run universities, I want to bring that education data in. We'll see that we're actually pulling our weight in some way, but we could do better. I believe we can do better, particularly if we look at where Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander people are living regionally in terms of inward regions or out regions, um, in terms of the percentage to the number of Indigenous people that could be at university and in terms of young people coming through and the future young people coming through. 15.7% of all Indigenous people that are actually at universities are in run universities. Okay. It's not like 5% or 7%, it's 157 It could be better. And we can work harder on that, and particularly looking at our future population projections of young people coming through. I think we really need to be thinking about what we're doing in terms of schools, whether it's with our HEP money, whether it's just with our general outreach programs, but how we're engaging people in schools, and I'll talk about that a bit, bit later. In terms of what the run universities are doing, and I thank Greg Davidson and his team for, this, for the data in these graphs, but... Um, You'll see that there's an increase across the board in terms of numbers. For me, I could go, oh, you know, CQ University, and I do. CQ University is doing really well. You know, we hit, four, we hit 470 for term one this year, which is the highest we've ever had. Um, for term two, we'll hit way over 500, and I'm not sure what we might project for term three, but we're going to clearly go way over 500. It'll be the highest number of undergrad enabling and postgrads this university's had. I um, mean, I think, Helen, if we've got about 800 or seven to 800 vet students, depending on what day we look at the data, uh, Indigenous vet students, depending whether they're doing things like a barista, short barista course or a diploma. So we do have a large cohort of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander students at Seeky University. But so do 
the other universities in the run group and are increasing their numbers overall and across the board, not just in education and arts, but across the board in terms of a whole range of courses um, and programs. And people need to be proud of that, but we need to keep that going. And in terms of where that demographic tsunami is coming, that young group, how do we engage those young people from the secondary schools through coming into either VET or coming into universities and run universities? How do we do that? How do we keep the focus on, the pressure on creating positive pathways for those young people? We can all, by the way, too, when we had a look at this on Monday, we had the Indigenous run group, we could all talk about what these little bits here were for us. So for us at CQ University, um, that was our change in our TEP program and um, looking at how we could uh, accredit that in terms of academic board for ITAS. Others had other issues that they were managing with funding at the time. So we can all pinpoint what happens, changes of staff, changes of policy. But, you know, we've all, despite all the things that have been going on, had changes that have uh, upwards. In terms of graduations, um, we're doing pretty good when you look at that list. Okay, for us at CQ University, we had 40. This is from last year. Is that right, Greg? It was last year's data. Um, that's pretty good, and I think it's one of the high. Well, it is the highest we've ever had. You know, in the past, we've sat. If we go back to 2011, 2010, we had like 12, 14. Then it increased a little bit up, and then it hit the 20, and we were all like, "Yes, it's 20." Well, now, you know, and then it was 30, well, now it's 40. So we've got to keep that trajectory because if we're bringing in an increase in students, we also need to have an increase in the graduations. The other reality for us in the run universities in terms of Indigenous students is they're predominantly part-time. If I look at the CQ University cohort, it's depending on the course and the program, it sits from 60 to 80% who are part-time. So people are taking longer to get through, but they're still getting through, okay? still getting through with, with support and focus. I wanted to put um, Alana Hunt's picture up there, not because she's gorgeous and all our students are. Well, I think that they all are. They're our young people coming forward and our older people who come to university. But Alana Hunt um, serves to remind me that she did her whole degree by distance. She did her honours degree by distance on Moodle, on an electronic platform. She still came to graduation. Um, she does live in a regional area, but she kind of symbolises in part some of the a lot of the students we have at this university. But she also serves to remind me now too that our students also deserve an equity of experience with non-Indigenous high achievers. And we are getting through some of our regional universities some really darn good students who aren't making the choices to go to the big capital cities, the UQs or the Melbourne Unis. Sure, some are, but others are choosing to stay within the regional network of universities. I will tell you that Alana Hunt has just accepted a full scholarship, both a living allowance scholarship and a fee scholarship for Cambridge University. Not an Indigenous scholarship, because they wouldn't have, they don't have Indigenous scholarships. A full scholarship based on her work and her record and her achievements. She will head off in September. She'll be here for graduation, the next rocky one, and then she will head off in September for the UK. But we are going to see as well, across the other regional universities network, high-achieving students like Alana. And we also need to think sometimes, because I had it for myself to think, well, when she said, oh, could I stay, Prof? Could I think I could do my PhD at CQ Uni? And I said, yeah, you could. And then she came up with that and I went, you got to go, sister girl, you got to go, you know, because you have to have, we also have to think about their needs and interests first and be proud of that too from a regional perspective. That's her family there, hey? Ooh. I'm going to move on to this uh, positive stuff that we need to be thinking about. Um, and for me, it's about changing some of the language used to talking about greater strengths. And I know 
that some people in this community were quite upset when the university restructured the Office of Indigenous Engagement and put a whole lot of programs into the remainder, the rest of the university and the Office of Indigenous Engagement was kept with just a small number of staff. And for me, that was something I had to kind of reconcile in my head too. But, you know, we need to think about where we need to go in terms of the demographics coming. We need to think about what we want in terms of what is ahead of us as Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander people, in terms of a university that now has 24 campuses and sites. Um, having a centralised centre is very difficult. Um, with that, how do we change some of the dialogue around to a strengths-based model of building on what capacities communities have, students have, and also people within the university, the non-Indigenous staff have within the university, to be carrying some of that and doing some of that heavy lifting. It shouldn't all be the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander centres doing the heavy lifting in universities. People need to be pulling their weight and working together to push things forward. And there, I'll let you read those, and my PowerPoint will be available at a later time for people to have a look at. But we do need to be starting to shift the language to a strengths-based model for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. And there's some other ones about a clear pathway and trying to have people come back, even if they leave, leave school, how do they get back in from you know, being disengaged or choosing another pathway and coming back into education? For me, the last one there about the strengths-based approach and the decolonising stuff is paramount. We need to be thinking about how universities operate, about some of the racism in universities, about addressing the structural inequities, around addressing the lack of and minimal number of Indigenous staff in universities, which is not reflective of our graduates and certainly not reflective of our student numbers and our increasing student numbers. And all of that is carried within that changing the framework and changing the systems thinking within the universities around Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. I made a decision when we had the change proposal and some of the restructuring that had happened to really start to focus some of my energy and the energy of my team into young people and to where we could get the most bang for our buck in terms of time, energy and money and sponsorships. And for me, in terms of looking at that demographic that's coming, I have only got to put, you know, I've got to put time and energy into thinking about our young people in schools. And so we put quite a bit of energy and if for myself, even as a PVC, I've been questioned about how come you want to be involved in a hands-on way in AIM? Because that is about motivating and inspiring some of our young people for the future. For AIM, and that's a Mackay photo there, Mackay has just kicked off this year. We started that off with a donation from a business. We now have um, HEP monies to support that program. But the numbers, and this gives you an example of what's happening in regions, the numbers in Mackay will exceed the numbers in Rockhampton, if not by this year, by next year. And Rockhampton has always been the bigger hub, and it's not going to be. They're the adjustments we have to make in our own heads. And you think about in your heads, for your regions, for who you're working with, what adjustments might you need to start making? They're going to hit 150 easy for Mackay, right, Marina? Yeah. It's a rocky group. Easy, 150, 160, we're oversubscribed, more people want to come. The AIM mentors, I think we've got over 40 mentors for Rockhampton alone. We've got more mentors than the university has for its general mentoring program. When we fire it up and fire some of the successful programs, other young people want to work with us to make change for our communities. I'm talking about non-Indigenous people. So we want to also fire up non-Indigenous people who are in our system, in our, in our regional universities and regional communities to bring about some change with us. We can't do this on our own. We can't do it without non-Indigenous adults who are staff and we can't do it without non-Indigenous young people who are also coming through. That's the Gladstone program. We've got principals and Greg over there on the right is a principal of one of the schools. We've got amazing staff. Um, and community members and involving culture as well as um, academic prowess. I've got that photo there of this deadly staff member Tash down here who works in uh, wide participation. But I put this photo up here and the woman on the left, Emma Harbin, was NAIDOC Scholar of the Year for Rocky 
but she's also a student here in Enabling and she also works part-time or full-time sometimes, doesn't she? So she also symbolises some of our students who are doing multiple things to be successful. But Tasha's program that she works with, the Community Aspirations Program, is that one of those programs I spoke about is trying to bring people back into the system that may have gone out of the system, either left at grade 10 or left at grade 12, and bring them back into the programs. And we all need those kind of programs in our communities based on our data. We're really investing in, and I know a number of the other regional universities try to do this as well, but for me, a lot of my time is spent talking with philanthropic groups, businesses about how we increase our scholarships to try and address some of those um, financial issues and barriers that some of our students face. Because um, in time, it's the scholarships, when they, things get tough, it's the scholarships, the, the top-ups um, to their living allowances that make the big difference and keep them in uni. We've got a new campus, um, and people will know that, that opened in Cairns last year. We did have a study centre. And for me, it kind of is kind of the new kind of centre that we have. And I'm hoping that our new centres, as they open up our campuses, also are going to reflect some of the local languages. But I put this photo here because we did have students and distant students in Cairns and the Cairns region who now come into campus. So the difference for them is, and this young woman on the left is an example of that, she was a student before we had the campus. That's Narita Davis. She's about to finish this year in law. So she was a student who was a distant student, still is a distant student, but comes in and uses our facility within the region to access a whole range of things and to connect with people. So that's that flexible model and trying to be more flexible in our regions that we service. And that's Henrietta Formal or Henrietta Mari, and people may know Henrietta, who works in the Office of Indigenous Engagement. I put, hey, just about winding it up, yeah. I want to put this because I wanted to showcase this. I went into this bus last week and I was blown away. The woman on the left on the bottom of the photo designed that bus inside and out. She is an IT whiz, she's a Torres Strait Islander, she owns a tier one company. Um, she's a digital champion in Queensland, she's had money from Advanced Queensland and she's wanting to work with this university or any other university. But there are Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander businesses and companies and people like Julianne Lamborn, who's featured up there in her work, who are out there wanting genuine partnerships with us, not being in a service role where we service her and service the community. She has that bus all around the Torres Strait, all around Aboriginal communities in the Cape York. She's already doing that work. We don't work with her. She's still going to do her work. She's still going to be out there. But we need to be, as regional universities, working across regions, looking for people like Julianne, looking for those Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people as well, or running, running businesses like this, who want genuine partnerships and genuine collaboration, and possibly research with the work she's doing. She also talked to me about uh, aquaponics. Anyone heard of aquaponics? Okay, so aquaponics. She's out there helping Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander small companies, small businesses get into aquaponics and value add to their business all up through the Cape. And it doesn't matter whether I'm in Cairns or going up into the Cape or west of here or down south, there are groups like Julianne, individuals and groups who are doing really innovative, really amazing, really fantastic work for the future. And if we as regional unis aren't partnering with people like her and like the others, we're going to be missing out. Just wanted to finish up on this dead or deadly. This is a group from Shellhaven, um, New South Wales. So the other part of some of the work I do around health is working not at the end part where people may be doing exercise or healthy programs or health stuff with people who are older people, but focusing in on younger people to change some of the life trajectories around. So most of those women who are in that program, and there is a young men's one as well, but their photo is a bit different, um, they range from 15 to 30. And they are really trying to, the, the, th the emphasis is in, you're either going to be dead or you're going to be deadly. And thinking about the long term, not the short term. 
you know, not the short term of, oh, there's something that needs fixing down here on the riverbank. Yes, that may need to happen. But for me, in terms of the focus for us, for universities, yeah, that's important. But we need to, in terms of the demographics and where they're heading and what's going to be happening with Indigenous communities, we need to really be thinking about the long term and how we're going to engage Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. And that's what, that's my finish this off. Yeah. Take questions? Oh. Have we got time for questions? Um, we're probably running a bit close to time for questions, but one thing Bronwyn does do extraordinarily well in her engagement role is the use of social media. So maybe I could invite people to get you on Twitter at Bron Fredericks. Send me a direct e direct message or Facebook. <laughs> I'm learning how to do Facebook, but direct message me or email me. One interesting fact people may not know from um, research from Wollongong Uni and Peter Adelf, who's now at Canberra Uni, was at Newcastle, is that Indigenous social media is 10 to 20 per cent higher than non-Indigenous social media proportionate population. So sometimes I know people in my university have a dig at me and go, oh, you reckon you probably spend a lot of time on that social media, Bronwyn? Or, you know, oh, you're doing too many tweets or whatever. But in actual fact, if I'm not doing that, I'm not engaging with the people I need to engage with. So you kind of need to be work out how your, where your people, in terms of your regions, what do they do? That's all I'll say. So email me. Twitter me, Facebook. Facebook me, ring me up, come and see me in the afternoon tea break. Okay. Thank you again, Mr. Bronwyn. Thank you. Thanks,